Yes, the Asha, we can start. Um, thank you all for uh, being here and welcome to the day two of Catalytic Change Week 2023. Uh, I'm Aniket, your host of Adhan Foundation. So requesting all of you to just uh, rename yourself with the name and the organization name that you are. Uh, so your name dash the organization name. Uh, I think we can start and uh, Mel, uh, can you just play the Catalytic Change Week video? Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produce groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education, with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 awards ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, buyer multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I would encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, CCW, as well, for letting this opportunity to share our work with our audience. Uh, we can start now. I think I'll introduce our uh, narrator, moderator today, Natasha Joshi. Uh, she's a developmental sector professional who has worked with multilateral organizations, foundations, and government across India, Mexico, and Singapore. And currently, she is serving as an associate director at Nilankani Philanthropies. She holds a degree in human development and psychology from Harvard University. And also, she's one of our advisory board members. Uh, I would like to hand over the session to you, Natasha. Please carry forward. Thank you, Aniket. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this conversation today. Um, I really like the title that we're going to be discoursing on, which is how can government philanthropy and business effectively Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar work together to further the goals of education for all. Um, 
in conversation today on this particular theme, I have a really lovely group of people, um, leaders in each of these sectors. And um, we're going to probably explore a little bit about how people-driven development can be designed, driven, and funded. So just a really quick round of introduction to the members today on the panel. We have um, Pita Vasilan K, who's the Principal Director, School Education Nagaland. Um, we have Srimati Sneha Gaunkar with us, who is a headmistress of the Government High School in Shelde Kepe. Um, we also have Dr. Madhura Bandekar. She is a passionate ecologist with a PhD in ecology from the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment. We have Jalandar Satpute, who is the CSR Head of Mastec Foundation. Shraddha Dalal, who is currently leading the Career Awareness and Exposure Program in Goa as the Program Manager at Adhaya. So um, with this okay. lovely group of people, uh, I'm hoping to sort of uh, open this conversation by first sort of giving a glimpse to all the people listening in about what programs can look like uh, when we are thinking of putting children and school leaders and systems kind of at the center of um, all kinds of education innovations. And to speak to that, I would sort of uh, invite the, um, Snehaji to talk a little bit about the program in Goa, the SSIP program in Goa, and uh, to share a little bit about what the program is and then you know I'll, I have one or two follow-up questions uh, but first just tell us a little bit about what this program is and, and how it's designed. Good afternoon everyone. Can you hear? All of you can hear mm -hmm. me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm here uh, to share some uh, something, uh, my opinion, my observation as a hub leader. Um, mm -hmm. I belong to uh, government high school, Shelde KPM. KPM is the Daluka. Uh, with regards to um, how the collaboration of government, uh, philanthropist, and uh, community uh, can make the education meaningful. First of all, with regards to government, I would like to uh, tell that uh, we have NCRT, SCRT, Education Department. Uh, these uh, organizations, or these are the uh, main uh, pillars, I can say, uh, they play a very important role in education system. Of course, the uh, SCRT in different states uh, they frame the uh, policies, uh, they prepare the curriculum, uh, then they uh, provide in-service training to teachers, and they are in the process of making the education system the best. They also provide the uh, academic uh, support to the uh, education department. So it's like they coordinate with each other and they do the best wherein we can see the improvement in the education system. But what we see nowadays, there are uh, in the last few years, what I have seen many uh, NGOs, many clubs also I can say, they uh, support the educational institute. In Goa, for example, we have different clubs, maybe Rotary Club or uh, maybe Lions Club. There are so many and there are so many NGOs also, they support the educational system, maybe by giving a, a support like uh, for the infrastructure, uh, providing some educational aids so that the quality of education is improved. Uh, there are so many other uh, schemes also, which is uh, which are governed by the government. For example, we have MPLAD scheme, wherein the computers are supplied to the uh, uh, many school, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, that uh, help in uh, uh, making the quality of uh, school mm. uh, uh, a better way, in a better way, I can say. Uh, we have also CSR, uh, mm -hmm. wherein they support the, so many educational uh, aids also. So in similar way, I find uh, this uh, Adhan Foundation, who has implemented the SSIP program since June 2018. And uh, 
we see lots of improvement in many of our government primary schools and the high schools hmm. they the adhyan foundation uh, i mean the uh, shala siddhi they have uh, constituted the framework and under this uh, framework uh, we have so many <coughs> sorry domains and standards uh, which are chosen during the meeting and then uh, the schools the primary schools under the uh, support of hub leader uh, mm -hmm. they plan the activities for the improvement of the school and one uh, the day is decided uh, wherein uh, to check whether the school has really improved so that is the confirming shift evaluation mm -hmm. so as uh, in the confirming shift evaluation we find there is a team uh, in which smc the community members are also a part of this uh, assessment team so on a particular day uh this assessment is done and uh then uh, it is confirmed with the with the help of different members of the team of course the parents the smc members are parents who are the who, who are the part of this assessment team so all this uh, all the criteria is uh, seen and then we can decide whether the school has really shown the improvement and they can go to the next level so uh, this is the thing what i see and uh, because of this i see there is lots of improvement in many primary schools as well as in government school uh, government high school sorry uh, see if you compare the uh, these uh, schools primary schools uh, prior to this ssip program we mm. see the most of the walls of the classroom were not uh, that full with uh, this but i see now the almost most of the uh, all the walls of classrooms are full with tlm or maybe not only tlm but uh, there are so many other things which are to be which are display in the class so uh, gen, uh, uh, what i can say is there is lots of improvement mm. due to this and the teachers especially they become very active they are like always in a, a state of doing something so that they can improve their school they can raise the standard of their school uh, to a certain certain mm -hmm. extent yeah mm. uh, as a as a community i can say actually uh, although the parents are uneducated i have seen they love this uh, doing that as a part of a assessment team and uh, um, they they feel very proud that they are one of uh, they are the part of the school so yeah. thus we see uh, community also play a very important role in making our education meaningful hmm yeah hmm. yeah that's right um sneha yeah. ji one follow up question i have yeah. you know you've explained yeah. how the both the government and the ngo sector can come together to design and also in some sense deliver a strong quality education program and by using a standardized in some sense framework yeah. for what yeah. how how to assess uh, a good quality school but um, can you talk a little bit about some of the big challenges you you as a hub leader and of course your peers the teachers faced when the program first started uh, because you know there are there are many good initiatives but there yeah, are also yeah. many challenges and then how you overcame some of those challenges yeah the challenge i find it is the um, Uh, shortage of times because we are we are having along with the ssip program we are having so many other things and there is a time limit also to maybe uh, not only this reports or there are uh, see there are uh, maybe uh, other activities which are going on simultaneously mm. so for uh, this program once we select once we select that uh, standard from certain domain uh mm. we need to work on that we are supposed mm. to give time uh, to prepare for that so as per the uh, framework as, as i said we have to go to that target and then uh, once we reach that so mm. you need time so i think as a, a hub leader i have seen this there are so many other things uh, uh, support visits are there i have to give time for that for the mm. primary school for me i have mm. uh, seven primary school under me so yep. i had to uh, uh, monitor them uh, continuously by support visit or mm. maybe by uh, some meeting some physical meeting some uh, online meetings also so mm. that challenge i feel uh, and 
see we are busy with the high school uh, uh, activities but uh, at the same time we have to finish with this also before the yeah. academic year so that time limit i feel that it is uh, challenging otherwise uh, yeah they are the uh, primary teachers are cooperative they they took they take guidance from me uh, whenever they need so i feel mm -hmm. that time limit so we, okay. there is a bit otherwise we don't have any other this thing issue like for implementing this Mm, okay, that's really yeah. helpful. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And I think I want to pick up from that and, you know, sort of um, go yeah, to yeah, yeah. Mr. Tavasilan now because uh, one of the uh, things. Should that, I? Uh, uh, okay, time limit is over. So any no, any no. one more point I just want to highlight. No, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. Uh, okay. okay. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a conversation. So we'll come back to yeah. you. Um, because I want to link it to something that Sir is doing in 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 Nagaland, and uh, you know, my okay. question to um. Mr. Tavasilan is that you know one of the things I'm hearing uh, Sneha ji saying is that you know the schools can pick the standard and then work on the standard that they choose to work on and there is an element of autonomy there in that what is it you want to work on and so I think um, it would be great if you could share with everybody a little bit about uh, the program that you're leading, the performance incentive grants project that you're leading, uh, because it it really centers this idea of autonomy, incentive, what is it you want to do and how do we get schools and school leaders to want to sort of, you know, make choices. So if you could also just maybe first share a little bit, because it's a new program, or at least, you know, uh, many people may not have understood the nitty gritty of the PIG program. So share a little bit about what the program is. And then, of course, um, how does it sort of uh, build autonomy in, in within the state that you're leading? So, thank, thank you, Ms. Natasha. So I'll, I'll quickly sort of uh, give you the context in which this program is being run. So uh, we uh, currently have a World Bank funded project called the Nagaland Education uh, Project, uh, The Lighthouse. So uh, the whole idea is, is, I mean, the project essentially has two objectives, two broad objectives. One is to improve the... Uh, you know, uh, governance in schools across the state, not, not just the schools, but but the entire education ecosystem. The second mm -hmm. objective, broad objective, would be improving the teaching and learning practices in the schools. So the performance incentive grants is, is something that we're working towards uh, in, in this as a part of this, this project. So the basic idea is very simple. Uh, you know, you sort of empower the community, you empower the SMCs and SMDCs, because they'd be the best best judge of what what the school needs, uh, you know, since mm -hmm. they they sort of interact with the teachers and and you know the parents on a on 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 a daily basis, they'd be best suited to figure out what is it that the school needs or it doesn't need. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we we decided that okay we'll we'll fund them and allow them to tell us what they want and let them let them do it uh, on their own. So uh, we just essentially putting it back to them, uh, but just just enabling them in terms of finances and allowing them to transform the schools in a certain sense. So, um, you know, the whole idea is it's essentially needs-based planning. I mean, you look at the local context, figure out what you need, and then you decide on what you want to do with the funding. So the performance sensitive grant, so every single school in Nagaland is, is eligible for this. So primary school is given an amount of 3 lakh rupees, uh, middle mm -hmm. school is given 6 lakh rupees, high school is given 8 lakhs, and higher secondary school is given 10 lakh rupees, and four equal installments over a period of four years. So uh, the two things that work uh, simultaneously, one is, uh, is is a fact that we're allowing the communities to sort of, uh, you know, tell us what they need. So mm. that's sort of enhancing their ownership. And the second, the other element that we're sort of bringing to the table is, is uh, you know, one of the reasons why SMCs and SMDCs have not been, have not been very effective, except in, 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 in uh, uh, pockets. So uh, I think so, so, this in in the context of Nagaland. So that that's essentially what we're trying to do. The uh, undergo the transformation that we uh, emphasize them to, given the funding that's given, uh, especially because you know you possibly not monitoring it and ensuring that it's actually done on the ground. Mm -hmm. So the other other element that we brought to the table is is continuous monitoring, so that uh, we hold every stakeholder accountable. So what the SMCs and SMDCs do is, I mean, at the center of this whole initiative was empowering the SMCs and SMDCs. One is, mm. is several schools, the SMCs and SMDCs existed on paper, but then they were not, they were not sort of holding meetings. Uh, there were no parent-teachers meetings. So uh, 
So some of them uh, were aware of what they were supposed to do, but then it was not happening on the ground. And several others, uh, they 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 simply weren't very clear about their roles and responsibilities. So so the mm -hmm. capacity building was a starting point as far as this uh, particular uh, initiative was concerned. So uh, and under this it, mandatory formation of SMCs, SMDCs is 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 a very key uh, component mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, in inclusion of everyone, I mean, all, all concerned, parents, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the church leaders, women leaders, uh, uh, the, uh, the leaders from the particular village, if, if, it's a, yeah. if, it's a, if, it's, if the school is located in a village, and uh, women representatives, so all of that. So, so a complete revamp and uh, ensuring that they, they, their capacity is built in such a way that they're aware of what they're supposed to do. And, uh, you know, we sort of enable them to do that. So uh, what, what the SMCs, SMDCs essentially do is uh, they submit a proposal as to what they want. Now, there are certain, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't allow, uh, you know, uh, large civil works. We don't, we don't allow, uh, you know, certain activities which have sort of not allowed. So, so uh, okay. skill, skill training for students are allowed, you know, you, in, in no, some schools, they, 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 they take care of their uh, uh, wiring, uh, they, they, they paint the school. So, so, so many activities. I mean, what, what we've shown is just a very simple uh, cross section of what's happening in different, different schools. Some schools go for bala, some schools go for furniture and so on and so forth. So they give us their proposal. We vet the proposal at the, we have a project management unit, which is implementing the project. We vet the proposal. Once it's done, the money is directly transferred to their bank account. They implement mm -hmm. it. Then we have a rigorous uh, follow-up, uh, you know, monitoring mechanism where the district administration is also involved. Unless they sign off, they don't get the second installment. So uh, there have been cases where some schools have not done uh, the, the board uh, in the first batch, uh, we had about 10, 15 schools, which were not very uh, doing very well. So we'd held back the second uh, installment. So uh, oh, now okay. what they've done is once we've held back, the schools ensure that they finish the first set of activities to our uh, uh, you know satisfaction, and then they uh, ask us for the second installment. So so we sort of putting it back to them and ensuring and holding them accountable, which is what is uh, you know has worked beautifully for us. Uh, we've seen several instances where uh, where a particular school is has, has sort of given a proposal, but then the funding for the first in, in, in the first installment wasn't enough to complete the activity. They, mm. So the community sort of stepped up and and contributed and finished the activity without very waiting for the second installment oh, so they've been a lot of uh, stories and is there a uh, is know, there a the, bonus the, for doing very well uh, uh that's something that we're working on uh, you know once we finish the first so so the we have 1939 schools across nagaland so uh we we split them into three batches uh, the first batch was about 700 plus uh, 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 schools second batch was about 900 and the last batch is about 250 odd schools mm -hmm. so uh once we finish them the the top performers we are looking at incentivizing them and then giving them a lot more funds so that they can they can finish up what whatever else was was in their wish list yeah <laughs> um, you know, this is really, uh, I mean, it sounds really fantastic. And I just wanted to kind of um, ask a follow up question that, you know, uh, it sounds so commonsensical that, you know, schools should be given some amount of funds, discretionary funds, and then you should get the community involved and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in your experience as an officer of the government, uh, why does that not ha happen enough? Like, where is the bottleneck? in terms of mindsets or policy uh, you know why why doesn't it happen why, why are schools typically not empowered i think i think there's something that we, we we've seen it play out uh, you know I, so some of these schools I, I guess the the biggest problem was with regards to monitoring you know mm. if if you you sort of ensure that the fund is not given in one uh, uh, one installment and then you sort of spread it out over the year and ensure that everything that they're supposed to do gets done, and only then uh, the second, uh, the subsequent funding is released. Then I think I think there'll be a lot of change. Uh, the 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 thing that's made the difference for us has been the very stringent monitoring mechanism that we've put in place. So I guess that's mm -hmm. that's the point. Uh, you know, as long as you can sure. ensure that uh, they they understand that they're going to be monitored, and any subsequent uh, fund flow and and at a later point in time is going to be uh, sort of. Uh, contingent about how how well they've utilized the current funding, mm. it's it, it's just there. I my yeah. limited understanding. Yeah. How no, that's sure. yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm um you know I worked for ten years in education, so I have a little bit of 
you know, native curiosity for this. I have one last question for you. Um, and sure. here, I think I would also like uh, Sneha ji also maybe to come in with your comments on this particular topic, which is that when you take a scheme like PIG, which is really interesting, and I think it has great potential and it's also delivering, as you said, sir. Um, um can we also see this as an opportunity where the communication lines between, you know, community, school and system have improved? Therefore, is there potential to also look at some of the really larger structural barriers, which is, for instance, a teacher availability or, you know, larger civil works requirement? And, and then, you know, how does the kind of uh, department respond to some of those issues? Because those also stand in the way in terms of, you know, uh, remote areas, yeah. not, not having enough teachers, etc. So how do we look at that? Or how does the PIG look at that in terms of some of the you know, bigger uh, infra issues? I'll, I'll probably uh, ask sir to respond first and then Sneha ji, if you could also just give some thoughts on, you know, some of these other basics of education. I think, so, sorry, Ms. Natasha, I, I, I sort of lost you. Can, you. can you just repeat the question for me? I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. So my question is that, you know, I think a scheme like PIG is wonderful in enabling some of the one low hanging fruit, but also things that communities and schools can take charge of and can solve at their level. But then there are certain issues that need to be solved at the department and, you know, the, the state level, which is things like teacher availability, uh, you know, larger civil works. Um, so what's the kind of a relationship between a program like PIG and then also creating communication channels or feedback mechanisms to, to, to resolve some of those issues because they are also big issues. I, I think for us, the, the, the biggest contribution that PIG has made, apart from the fact that um, our schools have been transformed uh, you know, to the extent possible with the funds that's that's been given to them is is very enlightened SMCs and SMDCs and the mm. community as, as such. I mean, what we've seen is wherever the the SMCs and SMDCs play a very proactive role, uh, the 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 schools produce very good results, but they are also sort of very good at highlighting what their problems are. Mm. Um, a very proactive SMC, SMDC. I mean, we have several such cases. They sort of re reach out to us the moment there's there's a shortage. Of if a particular teacher, um, you know, teaching a particular subject retires, uh, we, we get a letter from them mm -hmm. saying that, okay, we need, so he, he or she is retiring and we need a, so in several cases, even before the teacher retires. So that's, that's one thing that keeps happening. Second is similarly, I mean, with even with regards to infrastructural issues. So, uh, uh, I mean, this, of course, I mean, we have a database of, of, of what's the situation with the various school structures across Nagaland. So, and that's something that we're taking up in, in, in a face manner, but then, uh, having the SMCs, SMDCs also highlighted to us and sort of helps us prioritize, uh, where we focus. So I think, I think an enlightened SMC, SMDC you know, the communication is sort of robust between uh, uh, folks on the ground and, and, and the department. And that, that's where it uh, plays a major role. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's lovely. Sneha Ji, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with SMCs, SMDCs to Sir's point? Uh, does it help in also solving some of the bigger kind of systemic challenges in Goa, for instance? Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Should I speak on this? Uh, some uh, related to funds. Eh? Yeah. In uh, Goa, we have Goa Samagra Shiksha. Under mm -hmm. that, certain funds are given uh, for us, but uh, uh, we have to strictly follow the guidelines. And uh, as uh, Sir says, um, SMC play a very important role. Whatever expenditure we do, they are in. Uh, 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 we are uh, we have to uh, take the uh, prior uh, listing from our chair for uh, chairman of smc so she is supposed to uh, the person is supposed to sign whatever the money we credit or whatever uh, those all financial this thing uh, that a chairperson of uh, smc is supposed to sign mm. uh, and uh, we get certain funds for uh, as uh, for example maintenance fund uh, uh, we have a grant, annual grant, but uh, we are st uh, supposed to spend that uh, money uh, strictly as per the guidelines given by the Goa Samagra Shiksha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and regards to teachers and this, uh, we uh, we don't have the, uh, I mean, we are not authorized to appoint. We are, we are getting, uh, not the regular teacher, we are getting what is called LBT in government schools, lecture-based okay. teacher. And uh, for that, we are supposed to take prior permission from our zone. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
so we cannot manage with those uh, funds uh, uh, in case if we need a teacher and this yeah any anything yeah no um, no this is useful uh, i think one of the other areas that tends to suffer uh, with uh, programs and especially academic outcomes driven programs is uh, Is, is something like all your extracurriculars, you know, your art, your dance, your career guidance, your uh, skilling, mm -hmm. um, and I think with programs like PIG, perhaps where Sir also mentioned that skilling is something schools can put up as a need, and you know, you can and the community can actually play a big role in sort of supporting with some of these extracurricular activities. And you know, um, I want to hear the experience a little bit from Shraddha on uh, the work that's happening on career guidance because that's something that is really important and very very needed it's a huge need so you know it's coming from the ground as a need but then how do you uh, systemically meet that need so could you talk to us a, a little bit about the career guidance or career aware program first and then you know again what is the role of the department what is the role of the community in in that Sure, Natasha. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah. So, with regards to um, career awareness, so what we realized uh, during the pandemic was that schools are, you know, expected to do a lot of activities like uh, building literacy, numeracy, uh, skill development, career counseling, maybe social emotional learnings, and more. And all this work towards making a student a good citizen. Uh, but to do so, it is very difficult for one school or the teachers alone. And I think here we see the value of Samaj, that is the community, and Bazaar, that is the corporate or the industry, to step in. Uh, so the career awareness and exposure program has started as a need expressed by the Goa State, where the state felt that students are always confused about, you know, choosing the right stream, choosing the right colleges, and etc., and that they need a very strong um, guidance or very strong mm -hmm. career guidance support in line with uh, to what our national education policy also says about you know career counseling and then uh, that's the time when adhyan quality education found foundation as an implementation agency stepped in along with antarang foundation our partner and that was a time when we looped in expert speakers and local industries into the program yeah Uh, to go into what career awareness and exposure program has been so it is a space for uh, students to explore career opportunities as you can see uh, career opportunities that are locally available um, understand what 21st century skills are and they able to articulate them based on the careers that they choose and also overall making a career plan for themselves so we all i mean believe that a good school um not only needs uh, for a student is not only education but skill development extracurricular activities career counseling are much much needed and in order to build all these things along with school uh, i feel engaging uh, stakeholders like parents smc members like ma'am said alumni community leaders industries is equally important a uh, school needs to connect to all this community that is samaj and bazaar uh, mm -hmm. which can help a uh, school i think to get practical knowledge um, yeah uh, for example now in career awareness program with the help of 54 industries and 60 expert speaker sorry 60 expert speakers we could uh, support the schools um, hmm. maybe to explore a number of career opportunities and also understand how these experienced people from various sectors maybe agriculture maybe ecotourism maybe finance you know could make this their own career decisions so hmm. how you know maybe in a single um, company you know have around Uh, like each company will have around departments or 30 40 careers in that same company which works towards the vision right mm. so um, another thing is goa being a tourism state you know what we saw in the students was that most of the students you know are aware of uh, tourism as a you know career or maybe mm. even mining earlier which was a career for most um, we also saw students you know knowing about the specific careers like teachers maybe or engineers mm. or government sector jobs so uh, the linkage with the industry and the linkage with this expert speakers helped us to explore 
you know new careers for them like agriculture ecotourism uh, human resource retail so students during this visit uh, spoke to the industry speakers uh, the industry representatives mm. the staff present there the team present and also they were given demonstrations on how the mm. you know the company works basically or what are the different small uh, you know uh, activities that were shown to the students um, mm. as you can see in the slide uh, the first photo that is students visiting takula mall that's the first mall in goa and uh, students were very excited and uh, they saw you know careers like human resource retail yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know they interacted with the staff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even in goa college of home science that is a department that students had never heard about you know they learned yeah. the metal tie and die so what was tie and die and how it is done was explained to them uh, even tanchikar spice farm that's a eco farm where a person you know uh, uh, teaches how um, goan tradition can be relived so uh, mm -hmm. the students got attracted uh, towards the age old tradition that goa has the food that is served so these are the different avenues that they could see also in the next slide if you can see uh, exposure visit was done at goa's only police training institute and mm -hmm. even solid waste management uh, in bicholim where students were shown how waste is segregated mm -hmm. or you know they also spoke to the swachhata adhikari so careers not only you know which are mm -hmm. So well advanced, or we say white collar jobs, they also looked into jobs which are neglected. So mm -hmm. it gave them a very good exposure, and mm -hmm. I feel that um, you know um, even the government feels that in order to make this process very simpler for the student, the linkage with industry, the connection to these experienced people, um, we did that through a confederation of Indian industries that is CII and Indian Women uh, Network Goa chapter, and it was. very helpful for us and all this linkages together with community with industry mm -hmm. i think surely students will explore a whole new space of careers and also it will make them you know uh, take career decisions for themselves i feel yes yeah that's great um you know and this is a question i actually want to pull madhura in also right now as somebody who does engage with the children um you know what um were you able to hear me sorry yes i think you are just okay freezing a little bit okay is it better now yes, yes slow but okay okay sorry <laughs> i think my internet connection is a little wonky um all right let's try um, we can hear you fine so, now <clears throat> okay great so you know uh, what is the connection between you know of course making children first first and foremost aware that there is a variety of careers that they can also map their interests to uh, what is the connection between that and then eventually them pursuing any of those careers you know and what are the what are some of the roadblocks in that journey how can we enable that journey who are the key who plays important roles so i heard from shraddha that you know parents are quite instrumental in being able to push their kids but um, at the same time you know there are so many other challenges in terms of being able to pursue a career of your interest uh, over and above knowing that that career exists um, so could you speak a little bit about the actual direct work with children and then how that process looks like and maybe even give some examples um hi thank you so much for inviting me to talk on this uh, it's uh, uh, mentoring children and students has been my passion so i've been doing it for uh, although that's not my profession i am an ecologist by profession and uh, i got this opportunity through adhyay and that was really good um i uh, work as an ecologist but my background is in uh, mapping and geography and so when i spoke to the children to the different students in different schools i had to start with the, you know i started with a with an exercise in mapping and just having an icebreaker with them so that they would uh, to get them interested because if giving them a, a lecture would be a boring sort of thing so i did a game with them and of mapping and then that's how i sort of introduced the career of um, being a geographer or an eco nature enthusiast and um, and how this could also be a career for them 
uh, taking one of the subjects of their interest for some people it's very interesting for some it isn't so uh, basically i think it really helped to show them that what they are studying is not all boring it can be linked to something which can earn them money in the future that uh, i think was really uh, good for me mm -hmm. and uh, also the process that adhyan had in place which was you know why did you how did you get motivated why did uh, did you decide your career did your parents decide it for you those kinds of questions were sort of we had uh, discussed earlier and so I did um, discuss about that with the students like I said oh I was very I used to love nature when I was a kid you know when I was your age I used to go out for camping wildlife and things like that and when I grew up uh, in college I thought of how can I convert it to something that can be useful for mm -hmm. me how can I convert it into a job so uh, so that's how I decided on my own or I explored, I looked around for careers in making my passion as my career. So um, making that decision for the students as to not decide everything on the basis of what your peers are doing or what your parents mm. are telling you to do, but also exploring on your own what you really like to do. That was mm. something I um, emphasized on. And I think a lot of students related to that and uh, which was very nice that they, you know, they some of them, even the boys said, I like cooking. And that was really good to hear that. Otherwise, there are very norms, you know, set norms and how things happen. So mm. that was a really good experience. I think there was very good feedback. I mean, the students got back asking questions that why did you choose that and what do you do every day so I think that's one more thing that I feel um, was very good about the Adhyan program was to the exposure visits of course because they actually got to see what was being done but for mm. us as speakers we told them what our normal day looks like mm. you know so so that's what students should know uh, you know when they're doing the career awareness program is that when you say a doctor every doctor is not going to cut people up you know, or see blood or wear a coat and, you know, with the stethoscope. Mm. Every doctor is doing different things. So you, if you speak, they speak to different people in different careers, then they know what their mm. actual individual day looks like. And then they like, they're like, hmm, I could do this, you know, like a pathologist could be in a lab and that's okay. That he's still a doctor. So those kinds of things are very important for the students to know what a day in the life of any practitioner looks like so that was really um useful yeah, yeah. That's great. um no that's true uh do you get um you know uh do you get interesting questions from students one is do you and this, this question's for shatha first do you get requests from students saying that we would like to know about a particular career and then what do you do with that request Yes, Natasha, I would just like to add one more thing here that when we started with a baseline study, uh, many of the students did not know, but when we asked them, you know, what career you would like to choose and they were blank, right? Mm -hmm. And even uh, uh, they never thought of whenever we asked them, you know, how would you choose your career based on what? So it's either your peers or either their parents or it would depend on their mark sheet. So they would say like, you know, once I get my mark sheet, if I get very good percentage, I'll go for science. If very less than I'll go for arts. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we thought to, uh, many factors that you know contribute towards career planning. Like we told them about interest, we told them about you know aptitudes, and there were different psychometric tests also which were done. Um, students wanted to know more about you know uh, uh, what we did was divided them into since we are doing it taluka wise for students. We uh, thought of get you know asking them you know you do you know about this career like maybe photography or do you know about something like as HR and then they hmm. went into exploring this act this different types of careers and it was through them that we had you know uh, I want to know about this career so can I get an expert speaker in this career who can tell me more about so they were hmm. even you know people wanted to know medicine so now as Madhura said you know it's not only that uh, you know doctor who cuts or operates it's like you have a physiotherapist you have a hmm you know different kinds of so even they wanted to know more i wanted to explore more opportunities in that field also yeah you know there's a question in the chat about you know identifying interventions for children in higher age groups 11th and 12th and uh, you know one one thing that sometimes i've heard uh, is that a lot of children just sort of kind of uh, like what happens in 12th standard becomes very pivotal and therefore they're really making their decisions at that time so should you be looking at an intervention at that age as well? 
And is there some reason as to why you don't work with children in 12, other than the fact that it's boards and you know, everyone's too busy doing that. Sorry, uh, I did not get your question. Could you repeat, please, Natasha? Yeah, my question is that, um, is there a reason why you are not doing interventions with class 12 students? Because uh, many times, you know, a lot of children don't plan very ahead and they kind of go with what's happening last minute and then their results and how they're feeling and what's happening in their lives. So a lot of decisions, the actual decision, the career decision probably practifies in class 12 with the stream they choose, et cetera. So is there a reason why you don't work with class 12 students? So we started with uh, the program with 9th and 10th standard students where we you know, had the psychometric test. But for the coming academic year, we are looking also at 11th and 12th standard students where the same okay. process would follow for them too. So okay. uh, we are in building. Right. So it just started with 9th and 10th standard and now we are going on to 11th and 12th also. Okay. And one question for Madhura is, do you uh, hear from students that I really want to do this, but I don't think I'll be able to? I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not, I'm, we're too poor, we can't do it. What do you say to them when they say that? Um, I get the question from girls because they think, uh, you know, a career in forestry or nature-based mm. uh, uh, systems are uh, difficult and uh, when I tell them about research as a career you know you can be sitting and reading and then doing all this they then they are like their eyes brighten up and like yeah this I could do so mm. uh, we do get that but not as much as I think we would have gotten uh, before and in Goa especially there's a much more liberal society and so everybody mm. can do everything I also wanted to add one more thing since there is a bazaar component also in this. So now I work for an uh, for a, a corporate outfit outfit which works in the domain of scientific um, uh, giving scientific inputs to uh, CSR initiatives and mm. people working for plantations on the ground. Um, and recently we did a project in which I had a bunch of students from the agriculture college coming in and, uh, you know, just doing simple things like measuring uh, heights of trees and uh, stuff on the on the project. And it, for them, it was so heartening and so nice to get out of the college and actually be on the farm, although they do things, uh, practical things uh, in their mm. uh, college, but to mm. actually see the that it's implemented and they get excited about doing it so I think the industry really should engage with uh, with academia to you know as interns as as volunteers it it is really really something that the uh, students in the student phase if they are made to do that they really learn a lot and it remains in their mind that is really um, that's something I'd like to say yeah that's nice um you know, I'm going to put on my own funder hat now and also invite uh, Jalandar, who is uh, part of a donor organization, um, you know, so to play yeah. kind of to play the bad guy here. Uh, you know, when you look at a career awareness program, uh, if, if how do you measure the effectiveness of this program? How do you know what you've achieved? How do you know what impact you've had in the lives of these children? How do funders think about programs like this and I want to understand Jalandar from you how does your foundation think about these kinds of interventions which perhaps may not have immediate outcomes but definitely have a great amount of influence in the lives of children and, and also look at other holistic aspects of their learning and development so speak a little bit about your own thinking on this yeah thank you Natasha first of all and uh, good evening to all of uh, so even I, I just wanted to continue with Madhura so this this year we have a proposal from the one of organization they want to do plantation for three acres in uh, Mur Murbad that is the Thane district and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to present that same presentation to the my board so and uh, the best part is like uh, the children from the schools they are going to monitor that project mm -hmm. so I mean that will definitely help to children's and they will love to uh, climate and weather I mean. Uh, toward the nature, right? Uh, uh, to the uh, Natasha's question, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, different. I mean, uh, since CSR comes in mind, like uh, everyone think about the fund only, right? The financial help. But apart from that, we we do, uh, I mean, we do have other, other partnership as well. Like, uh, mm. uh, see, I, I am representing uh, IT company. So there are partner organizations who require the uh, 
IT uh, help mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. IT sector, right? If yeah. any technical things they require, in that case, we can approach to the uh, the authorities and ask them to can we help in this uh, instead of uh, the fund, right? Mm-hmm. So and apart from that, since like this is an IT company and we have a, a good number of employees with us, so we can ask them to uh, even volunteer work. Mm-hmm. it's it's like uh, we can request them whenever they get free time uh, through online we had a uh, last year uh, one of organization and they asked for a uh, storytelling to the students in remote areas since it was yeah. in a covid situation that mm-hmm. time we we could help them to mm-hmm. uh, read the stories narrate the stories to the students which they can understand well right and mm-hmm. we ensure that the the uh, the employees they are from there. Uh, see, we have a uh, six cities presence across India. So mm-hmm. Chennai people, if they are not understanding English, so we uh, we help them in their own mother language, mm-hmm. and our staff they they could uh, uh, give uh, the narratives and the storytelling in their own uh, own language. So that's how like we can help uh, in other areas too. That's what I felt. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And, you know, I want to sort of uh, check in with um, Tavasilan, sir, on this interesting point that you have bazaar and industry entities who have bo- some amount of expertise that they can bring. Um, and they also, also, of course, have money. So uh, when you mentioned that at times, you know, there is an allocation that the World Bank is giving to schools, uh, but if there's a gap, then communities can also pitch in. Uh, what is your thinking on also involving corporate yes. industry like what's their role and if sir could maybe just speak a little bit of course in the context of the state you're in uh, sure. and then i'll come back to you uh, tilanda so i think i think i mean it's 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 everyone put together eventually i mean it's it's all these stakeholders will have to come together to sort of you know fill in gaps which uh, uh, the other can't, uh, you know, beyond a point. So we're already working with a lot of uh, corporates, uh, you know, as part of the CSR, uh, several initiatives running across the state. So hmm. eventually, yes, uh, the government cannot c- complete everything, uh, neither can the community. It's, hmm. it's like people with resources coming in and, and helping out, which sort of, you know, completes the, the circle, so to say. For us. Got it, got it. Um, is there an example uh, that you can share with us of uh, a good collaboration between government and CSR in Nagaland? Sure. So, uh, so we have an organization called the Global Himalayan Expedition. So what they've done is set up uh, computer labs in, in, in a few schools mm-hmm. and uh, they've also sort of um, um, put up solar power to support the computers. So that's one thing that's happening. Uh, American India Foundation is, is implementing a bunch of programs on, on um, uh, you know, related to environmental education. They're bringing mm. in more. Uh, we've had Boeing, which has come in and set up uh, innovation studios in some schools. Uh, they the two schools thus far, and uh, more would be, uh, you know, going forward. They're, they're in talks for setting up four more at least. So mm. uh, a lot of them uh, have been coming in, and uh, there have been some uh, organizations which have been uh, uh, donating, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, items for uh, KGBV hostels, the Kasturva mm. Gandhi Balika Vidyalaya yeah. hostels, which are situated in educationally backward blocks. So, uh, so several examples uh, this way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they they'd be. I mean, the the folks who have the resources coming in and helping will will really help us, uh, you know, accelerate the change, so to say. Mm. Mm. That's lovely, and perhaps it's interesting if there are opportunities for this kind of convergence, you know, coherence between. Um, Absolutely. You know, uh, everybody when like a state sets a nice framework, and then you know the private sector also kind of provides just more tailwinds to that yeah. same direction, rather than everyone trying to go in their own direction. Um, but Jalandar, you know, coming back to you, I just wanted to, uh, I'm curious about um, you know you work you work across six cities, and you said that in addition to funds, you also sort of offer the expertise that Mastec has. Uh, but uh, what are kind of like the most typical proposals that you get in terms of support and do you feel that as an officer would you do you feel that there are some constraints with um, CSR uh, or and there is some there is some opportunity to kind of um, 
support bolder ideas or do you believe that CSR is actually very well placed to support bold ideas? So, uh, see, uh, Natasha, even if you see uh, event 17 uh, SDGs, right? So, <clears throat> I, I, I'm like, uh, we are supporting only that 17 causes as for the CSR. Uh, even every, every company, every organization has a, their own policies. But as for the uh, even MCA guideline, like uh, whatever the fund you have, we have to disperse in our our periphery where we are present, right? Mm -hmm. So that certain like limitation has the CSR, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, there are a thousand. See, before this CSR uh, policy uh, placed, uh, Mastec doing uh, 2011. From 2011, we have a CSR for the charity for the communities, right? Mm -hmm. my, uh, my owner, he, he is from like, uh, uh, since long, he is doing the, the charity, right? Mm -hmm. Before implementing the CSR uh, uh, policy uh, in a, in a uh, central level, central. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I, I have like more than 1,000 uh, proposals in, a, in a different areas. There are animal welfare, old age, uh, education, health. But since mm -hmm. like uh, uh, we we are following seventeen SDGs, even SDGs. Okay. So according okay. to that, we have scrutinized the proposals. And uh, if it is like a suit in our periphery, then uh, like it's go to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I'm, um, you know, in the interest of time, I sort of sort of just want to go around the panel and ask each one of you to share that from your perspective what is the most impactful thing uh, that can help schools and school leaders provide high quality education so from your perspective well, what is the one thing that you think really needs to be done in order to improve overall quality of schools um, and of course if you have a government lens, you can talk from the government lens. If you have a business lens from that lens, but within your own realms, what is the one thing that you think is really impactful um, and we could benefit from? So I'm going to start with Snehaji. Uh, according to you, what do you think is the one thing that would be really, really useful? Yeah, uh, it's like, uh, in fact, uh, infrastructure is a must for all. Um, apart from this, uh, more and more, uh, uh, what I say, teaching it. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, in our taluka, uh, just I want to intervene that CSR uh, has provided uh, uh, two uh, two smart boards in each government school. There are eight government schools in Kepem, and each school got two two smart boards, which can, which we can utilize. I think that is one of the good uh, this uh, we got so that we can use the technology to reach to the student uh, mm -hmm. there and there we can just show them whatever uh, previously we used to uh, just go with the textbook and this but now uh, with the help of this uh, uh, board smart boards we can uh, show uh, at that time the suppose we want to show something uh, to the student during the teaching time so that is possible because of this so the mm. at the same time what i say technology is also very important so that we can take the student to the um, higher heights okay thank you that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, Tabasi and sir, from you. Yeah. So, I think I think it's really difficult if it's just mm -hmm. one thing. But it's a combination of uh, two things. Is what, what I suggest. One is capacity building. The second would be a combination of um, you know curriculum assessment and and uh, pedagogical reforms. You know, that's four things now. That <laughs> 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 so, okay. so it's really difficult to just pinpoint. One yeah. one aspect, you know, the multi <laughs> uh, pronged attack, yeah. You know that, but that's actually true. It's true. It's very integrated. Uh, but still, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna still ask uh, Shadha, give me one thing according to you that uh, you think, or maybe just say one thing that you think is does not currently exist but is needed. 
um, I think linkages yeah. with the community, maybe I would go with alumni. So showing mm. them practical knowledge of how successful a student from the same locality is now, I think that is more important, showcasing success mm. of a person so that it motivates them. Another thing, small thing to add would be demonstrations, giving them practical mm. knowledge, not mm. just being in the classroom and understanding theories. I think going more for practical knowledge. And of course, school is not the only one who can do that it has to be from around the community from around the industry yes yeah that's right that's right uh Madhura? i think Shraddha stole my words but but uh, i would the only thing i would add is that to engage the school should actively engage with the community and the you know encourage thing participation interaction of volunteers or others around the community or across the board you know some fab they can get a, somebody who the school the children idolize or something like that which will really mm. it really helps it brings it builds impact in the students minds and it becomes something different from the curriculum and the studies and all that so interactions and that i think is really it it makes a big difference for them to mm. see actually what is happening so demonstration like sure that's it that really helps mm. i think yeah yeah, that's right. Um, Talanda, what about you? Yeah. So, uh, see, uh, we we are dealing with human in the social if you aspects. If you see, actually, we are dealing with human. We are not an engineer or doctor that uh, the screw or bolt be tight and then we'll get the result, right? It takes few years, one, two, three, four years. But ultimately, whatever the fund has been disbursed to the organization, are we getting the proper impact and the the uh, it, it it is rich uh, to up to the beneficiaries that's the uh, basically any funder or any supporter is required impact mm -hmm. you know if i could paraphrase what you're saying a little bit i think one, one very impactful thing on the funding practice side for instance would be to take a slightly more patient view on change to take a slightly yes. more you know uh, holistic view also not to think that there are very direct like input out there's not a button you know you press a button yeah, and then you exactly. get an outcome you know so take that kind of yeah so that, that that's a really great um that's a really great point i i just want to check i, I believe uh, we have mr savaikar on the call as well um uh, mr savaikar if you're here can you unmute yourself hmm. Hmm. See, I we saw somebody with the name MS, and we're hoping that that's so. Uh, okay, um, Mr. Savaikar is actually the deputy director planning at the Directorate of Education in Goa, and uh, he's also assistant director of education Samagra Shiksha Goa. So, uh, for everyone else's context, he was meant to be on the panel as he could also speak a little bit about the systems improvement program in Goa, but he wasn't able to make it because of a last minute um, meeting. So I- That's okay, I, believe, I think. Okay, yeah, uh, great, it, lovely. So if there are any uh, questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, and um, I believe I'm also just scanning the chat to see if we have not addressed anyone's question. I believe we have. Um, Okay, we have a comment. Yeah, if you have any reactions also, if you have any reactions, if you want to share anything about any of the listeners want to share any, uh, you know, if you want to plus one anything somebody has said, or if you have a comment based on your own work that you're doing in education, you can also share that on the chat. Um, we could maybe wait for a minute just to see if there are any responses coming in. In the meantime, uh, as we wait for the responses, I just wanted to, of course, thank everybody uh, who's come and shared on this panel today. I think the work that each one of you is doing is absolutely tremendous and um, and, and, and a re I think a real call out to, you know, Jalanda's point on being patient and Madhura's point about being uh, on mentorship for children. I think that's very important. What Shraddha said, I really liked about role modeling. I think all of us actually, not just children, but really children need positive role models. Um, Nehati, I was very inspired by the kind of work that Goa has done. Um, but I also do agree with you that infrastructure is really important. And um, 
you know, I am excited to see what Nagaland does with the PIG program. So I think these are, this is testimony to the fact that I think the education sector is always very buzzing. It's always very exciting. It's full of innovators, thinkers, and actually philosophers, uh, which is what makes it one of the best places uh, and most rewarding places to work at. So since we have no longer, uh, no more questions, um, I'm going to close this panel and thank you all once again for your time and thank you listeners for listening in. Thank you so much, Natasha. For the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. Much. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. And there are more sessions taking place tomorrow and day after by Adhyan Foundation. We have um, our Goa team representing how school complexes as a structure has worked so well in the past five years in Goa. Um, we have people like Mrs. Sneha Gankar who've come in and who are going to talk about it tomorrow, same time, 3.30. Um, so you can go onto the um, Catalyst website uh, and register on that. Uh, thank you, Mel, for putting in the information. Um, there's also another event that we're doing on the day next, uh, which is on the 4th of May, where we're talking about Tripura's program. Um, again, to how policy can come into practice and what does it look like when we're working at scale. Um, so yeah, that's what... Um, the next few days look like and there are many many more uh sessions which all of you might be interested in that catalyst is hosting please go on check it out and thank you so much for coming in uh thanks natasha for moderating today's session always always a good talk to hear from everybody um thanks thanks a lot all right good evening goodbye good evening Bye. goodbye Bye -bye. Mm -hmm.